Welcome back, everybody, K3 cohort members and any guests who might be joining us today to another Green New Deal Housing Train the Trainers webinar. Today is Green Power with guest instructor, Jesse Dahl. I am one of your co-hosts, Rachel Wagner, and I'm here with Josh Vandenberg. Hello, everyone. This webinar is part of Green New Deal Housing's Train the Trainers project. We'd like to thank the T3 sponsorship and support of the University of Minnesota RSDP, the Regional Sustainable Development Partnership, the Energy Conservatory, and Minnesota Power. We ask that you please keep muted unless you're speaking, except not co-hosts. Um, T3 cohort members are encouraged to ask questions and join the conversation as we go. You don't have to wait till the end. You can put thoughts and questions into the chat as well. Our guest today is Jesse Dahl. After high school, Jesse joined the Carpenters Union, Local 606 in Virginia, Minnesota. He graduated from the Hibbing Community College Electrical Maintenance Program in 1999 and joined the IBEW Local 292 in Minneapolis. He received his NABCEP Solar PV certification after training from the IBEW in 2009. He was hired to build a NABCEP entry-level course at Hibbing in 2009. He currently leads the electrical maintenance program at Hibbing College and has been teaching the electrical students here since 2015. Jesse, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. We are looking forward to a robust conversation on the topic of electrical systems for better homes and about training both our existing and incoming workforce in greener construction practices and integrated systems that result in healthier buildings without fossil fuels available to everyone. We do have some questions prepared for you, uh, but we also just sort of hope to launch into conversation. We know that your story uh, alone gives us a lot to talk about today. So without uh, any further, Josh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. To me? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Jesse, you're a journeyman electrician, solar installer, and an educator. Um, can you tell us more about uh, your career path, your career trajectory, and how you sort of ended up, landed where you are today? Yeah, I uh, I just, well, first I thought I was just going to be a carpenter. I was just going to pour footing, then... Uh, and then I signed up for the electrical maintenance, the pro program I teach now, I, I graduated from in 1999. And so I'm the third, I was the third generation of my family to belong to the Carpenters Union. So we were all grandpa, my dad and I were all carpenters, and I was just going to do that. But then I noticed that the carpenters weren't beat up at the end of the day, and they had nicer vehicles, and they were cleaner. So I thought, well, I think maybe I'll try the electrical field. So I did the electrical classes. And then uh, when I was getting ready to join to work as an electrician, I kind of looked around the state and I saw that the, the training in Minneapolis was more what I wanted to do. They had a better training facility, the IBW did down there, than they kind of had other places. So I headed down there and then I was just going to install lights and build schools. But then they built a really great a guy named Daryl Thayer uh, built a really good training program, a solar training program at the IVW. And so I was laid off at the time. I'd been off for probably two years at the time. It was in 05-ish, 07. There was a big downturn. And uh, so I took the solar classes, happened to sit next to a guy who was starting a solar company. And so he could take me off the books and I could go to work for him. So I got to work for him and I did a bunch of solar jobs all over Minnesota for him. And then one day I did an interview on NPR about solar. Um, I had signed up for this little, um, I think it was on Gather or something, whereas people were laid off and you were kind of retraining, they were kind of tracking those people. So I did an interview on NPR and my electrical teacher heard the interview and he wanted to start a solar class. So he called me, I happened to get laid off that summer and then I applied for the job and then I ended up teaching. So none of this was ever anything I was ever going to do. I uh, don't really know how I ended up where I am, but it was all these little accidents and happened to sit next to somebody. And uh, it was, yeah, it was not the plan. So, you know, your plans can go out the window for sure. You, you never know where you're going to end up. Doors open and 
I, at times I was like, I don't know if I can teach. Can I? I mean, I never, was never a teacher. I didn't take any editing school for it. Uh, but I took the opportunity and this has been the best job I've ever had. Teaching is by far the, the best job I've ever had. So uh, it's been I, a long, windy road. I absolutely love your description of, of your road. And um, when working with my students from time to time, I'll just talk about the crooked paths we take. And, you know, I, I picture myself in a canoe or kayak and the river is really showing me where I'm going. It's I have I have enough control to, you know, sort of continue on maybe yeah. sort of safely. But it does feel like, a, you know, in, in my experience, too, getting pushed from one thing to the next. And here we are. Yeah. 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 None of it. I mean, pay cut. I mean, working as an electrician was the highest paying job I've ever had. I mean, it definitely was a sacrifice for pay to do what I do now. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I love it. I just I love teaching. So as an instructor in the electrical systems um, in the school, are you able to weave in concepts about PV, renewable energy, and even energy efficiency into the curriculum and training? How does, how does that go for you? So when I, so when I taught just the, the solar class, I just did a one-year solar class, which was basically the first year of electrical maintenance. So I did theory, ACDC theory, some residential wiring. And then the second semester was uh, PV design, PV maintenance and installation and PV concepts. In that class, the whole second semester was all that. It was PV, uh, energy efficiency. I was teaching stuff for the MREA in Wisconsin. So we we're doing their site assessment certificate as well. When I took over the electrical program now, we have a six credit class, which is renewable energy. So then now in that class, I talked about solar we do and we're you know we're now we have to do EVs we have to do battery backup we're, I mean it's it's getting to be a lot to cram into a six credit class and then so in that class we do all of that but efficiency you know everybody should be learning about energy efficiency so we talk about I mean, when I say incandescent lamps these students have no idea what I'm talking about they don't even know what an incandescent lamp is anymore you know they're like incandescent so I'll say, did your dog ever have a lamp in the doghouse that kept it warm? And they go, oh yeah, the hot one. You're like, yes. You know, <laughs> so their idea of efficiency is a lot different than what, you know, being in the mid forties, we've seen a lot of changes in efficiency. So we talk about electrical efficiency in my class. I don't talk, well, we do the habitat house. When we build the habitat house for habitat for humanity, we have to wrap all our boxes to keep air flow out which we never, when I first started residential wiring, you just stuck a plastic ball box on the outside of the wall. We didn't insulate it. We, you know, that wasn't our problem. In the Habitat House, they have standards for efficiency. So we have to have special boxes with gaskets and wrap it and insulate it, which we, you know, every house built before 2020, none of them had, none of them houses had that, you know. So we do a lot, yeah. I mean, in a few credits, we cram a lot of efficiency and PV into our course. Excellent. Well, and and I I guess um you know when when uh when you're working through the the efficiency piece, like what 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 sort of what does that look like with your students? You know, sort of specifically, what are those topics that you're hitting? What what you know, and 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 then maybe too, what what are your students' responses to to learning about those sorts of things? So we. So we have a, I don't know if you know what a kilowatt is, it's a plug-in device you can plug into the wall and it can show amps and that. So we have a setup with uh, fluorescent tube lights, T5s, T8s, T12s, and LEDs. So the old, you know, four foot fluorescent lights. And that's where we first start talking about, like look at the, you know, when current flows, you create heat and magnetism. That's, that's what electricity is, heat and magnetism. So with, incandescent lamps it's all heat you're just wasting this electricity you're buying as heat now look at led it's seven watts it's putting out more light than the incandescent does and there's no heat that's efficiency right so we start very simple with with things like that um and then at the habitat house like i said with the wrapping of all of our boxes we talk about the envelope and we don't get a ton into like how that affects costs and heating and cooling because it's a you know it's a five credit class and building that house is kind of the big part of what we do we got to get this house built for this family um but we are right now currently building a mock house in our one of our big classrooms with the hvac program and in that in that house we are gonna the carpentry program at masabi 
is going to build us different wall sections with cut lines so you can see the insulation, different types of insulation inside of it. And then we'll have air source heat pumps in one of the house sections and we'll have just off peak heating in one of them. And then we'll have, uh, we're buying, we got a grant from Minnesota Power to do some air source heat pumps and geothermal stuff with that uh, from Minnesota Power. So it's going to become more of a, a, a part of it. But efficiency wise, you really just talk about, you know, lighting efficiency. And then when we get to PV, we talk about if you're going to go off grid, you have to be way more efficient than you are if you're just plugging into your house. You know, you can't have 27 clocks on the VCR. And if you're using batteries to run your house, you can't have clocks on all over the place because they're all using energy. So you have to think about every single watt you use and how efficiency plays into there. I love that you start with a lighting example, right? And we'll, we'll do that a little bit with my students too. And just that metaphor of a light bulb sort of going off, like that energy awareness that's created. And then all of a sudden you, at least I find with my students, sometimes they just can't stop seeing where the energy is anymore. Like it's just, they see it everywhere they go. Um, just that awareness just kind of blossoms. It seems like once, once, uh, once you bring those sorts of topics up. Yeah, it's kind of like when um, fish houses, I get this a lot from my students with their fish house. They never thought about it, but they have a, they'll have a 12 volt meter in there showing their battery bank and they never knew what that really meant. So we start talking about, well, you know, 11.10, 11.9 volts is a dead 12 volt battery. So you've got to, every time you turn lights on in the fish house and you fans on, watch that fuel meter. And then they start by saying, you know, I never thought about that. I never looked at, that is my gas gauge for my electrical usage. So that was a big, that's a big eye-opening thing for them too. That's nice. very cool. Nice. You know, you, you talked a lot about lighting and of course appliances, and now there's this surge that I don't think is going away of interest and financing and awareness around air source heat pumps and other heat pump technologies with this push toward electrification of systems that traditionally in our region have been um, powered by fossil fuels. So what what does that look like for you as an instructor, but also as a tradesperson? How is this surge in air source heat pumps and these heat pump technologies sort of affecting your work and 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 the communications and curriculum? So we don't, the, the HVAC program does a lot of the heating and cooling portion of that. So like Clint, Clinton Spots, who does our HVAC program, he would know a, a ton about the that mm -hmm. part. What, what we look at really is just what size circuit do you need? How do we install mm -hmm. that? What are the code ramifications for that? So I, I don't know a, a ton about just that specific heating system. One of the things that I do look at kind of just living where we live in that is just that the materials needed to, if we're going to electrify all this stuff, the materials that have to come to do that is something I, I talk to my students about a lot. Um, just about keeping that in mind that, you know, it, energy with solar, we say solar that it's, you know, it's free energy and it, it is when it's up and running, but it's, you know, it's silicon, it's aluminum, it's metals, it's zinc, it's copper, it's you know, all this stuff has to come together to then be used to create energy. And so where do we get that from? Does that have an impact wherever we drag it from? Um, I talk about that a lot in class because I think it's an important conversation to have just so people kind of understand that when you turn that switch on, you know, it's not magic. There, there's something either burning somewhere or there's sun hitting somewhere, or there's wind spinning somewhere, that the energy is coming from something somewhere. So, uh, yeah, I can't speak to like the specific um, heating or cooling part, but um, sure. electrification is a big thing. Like, we're going to put a lot of EV chargers in Minnesota. You know, we got a lot of money from the infrastructure bill. That infrastructure bill was a huge piece of legislation that is going to put a lot of money into trades and mm -hmm. electrical, especially. Mm -hmm. So, where do we get that? Where do we get those materials from to do that? Yeah. Right. Well, some of us, not only me on this uh, webinar today, were part of a pretty long um, post-occupancy meeting um, this week about um, the, the functioning of an air source heat pump in a new super insulated house and the ERV. Um, so both of these are HVAC technologies 
but it's looking like some of the issues in operation are having to do with the controls and the thermostat and the wiring of or certain controls that were selected. Um, so I'm I'm curious is is when when HVAC equipment goes in like that, are those controls then um, wired managed usually by the electrician or is the HVAC installer or is it either or? Do you know? Yeah, well, it's uh, it can be a source of uh, strife on job sites because it's, in my understanding of the electrical code, is that if it's not integral to the equipment, it's not HVAC's work. So HVAC, most of them are not electricians, so they have limits on the voltage they can work with. So if it's under a certain voltage, then anybody can really do that work. And there are even some carpenters and pipe fitters and plumbers who are starting to take some over the low voltage control work because they're already putting the pipes in. So why don't they run the controls for it too? Um, so it really depends on the voltage. Um, I would feel comfortable any HVAC tech or electrician installing any of it. I mean, really, I mean, especially if you were, HVAC, if they say, oh, we're installing Carrier, just to name a brand, I don't know who's making these things, mm -hmm. but they would go to training, they would get certified on that piece of equipment, so they would kind of understand the controls of them, mm -hmm. but most electricians would be able to read the schematics and create the wiring system too, but um, yeah, if it's, if it's lower voltage, it tends to probably be the HVAC. Uh, people who would install it. Anything like 120 and above, that's usually where the 120 volts or above is where the electrician would come into play. Good to know. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Hate to give away my work, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, well, we can probably should move right back to PV because speaking about not giving away your work, I, you know, yeah. we talked about the surge of interest in air source heat pumps and other heat pump technologies, et cetera. But there's also, of course, uh, the cost of PV is dropping and there's much more interest in subsidies and awareness, I think, than there was, you know, even 10 years ago, even five years ago. Um, do you see the potential for PV and renewable energy to become a more integral piece of more electricians' work? Yeah, it's, I, I tell my students, and I don't, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but I kind of say uh, most of you will probably see battery banks in your lifetime working as an electrician, which was not, you know, that was not a thing when I, 20 years ago when I got into the trade, um, you know, at our school, our whole residential wiring lab is all run off a, I call it bimodal system. It's named something, depending on where you take your solar training, it's a different type of system. So it can either, we can either sell energy back to the Hibbing PUC or if the power goes out, we can run off our battery bank. Um, so this house has a battery bank in it. If you had a lot of power outages someplace, this would be the kind of system you would want if you didn't want a generator running outside, don't want to worry about the gas. We also have an EV charger with a battery system. So you can run your house or your car or pull off your car to feed your house in case of an outage by solar edge. So, and then we have an old, we put a system in, in 1999, we have a Y2K, for those of you who remember Y2K, <laughs> we, have, we have a Y2K inverter uh, made by a company that's now owned by Square D, which is just an off-grid. We have a Bergie 1000 watt wind generator and then a small array and that runs an old Trace, Xantrax Trace systems. We have three or four battery banks on campus, which is not what everybody has, but, I tell the students, like, you know, meters these days have to have um, the, the ability to read DC and stuff because you're just going to, you're going to see more batteries in your lifetime and solar. They're putting huge solar farms up all over the place now. Um, you know, every utility is installing them. So 10 years ago was not the case. It, it will be, most electricians will work with renewables or batteries sometime in their, in their career. Yeah, and I, I think um, that it's an interesting thing that that we see. So in my school, anyway, we're, we're preparing a handful of students every year to do PV installation, but the bulk of the industry is hiring folks from other industries to do uh, solar installs. So we're seeing, like my student graduates are working with roofers and they're working with um, carpenters and they're working with uh, other sorts of trades who have transitioned into uh, solar installation, uh, in part because in Wisconsin, you don't have to be a union electrician to, to touch that equipment. Um, 
And so I don't know what, what it's like where you're at or, or, or how it is uh, in terms of like the people who are actually installing solar, how many of them, you know, are electricians, dedicated electricians, how many, you know, do they just focus on the solar installs themselves? And, and what does that industry sort of, sort of look like, um, you know, where your students are graduating and going to work? Yeah, I, well, you know, coming from a, as a carpenter, when I started off, I, that was really great training so that when I started doing residential PV, I knew where the trusses were, I knew where the rafters were, I knew where to put blocking in the attic, I knew where to cut shingles to, to flash everything we had to flash. Um, and, you know, that work does not have to be done by electricians, you know, the, the electrical work must be done, the conduit running, but as far as the State Board of Electricity in Minnesota, and I think it's still kind of, I mean, we might want to check, don't quote me directly on this. It's kind of a gray area um, that that part of mounting the modules and setting the railing on like a roof does not, you know, driving the pilings is done by 49ers if you're doing a big ground mount system. So there's there's lots of work for lots of people in it. Uh, most electricians, if they have the job, they'll do everything. Uh, mm -hmm. But I know like uh, places like Energy Plus and places in Duluth that they hire electrician to do the tie-in with the meter and the utility but they have a crew that does, you know, the mounting of the modules and the rails because that's, it's not really, doesn't really have to be an electrician. Some like the DNR require a NABCEP installer. They did years ago. Maybe they, they might've changed their regulations now, but they used to require a NABCEP installer on all their projects just to watch over everything that was happening for safety and installation and errors and stuff. So there, there's a lot of avenues to get into it. Um, even just designing it, and then subbing it out to somebody, you know, to do with the installation. There's lots of different avenues to, to get the work done. And for those who aren't familiar with that long acronym, can one of you guys sort of spell out what does NABCEP stand for? The NABCEP is the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners. Thank you. Yeah, they're yeah, they're like the they're they're a pretty high standard on detecting and certifications for solar PV, thermal wind. I don't think they do wind anymore, really. But um, if you're looking for something on your resume, um, there those certificates and classes they offer that are from certified uh, trainers from them, those are good classes to take. Those are ones if you were looking into PV, that's where I would find some online classes or or boot boot camps. They usually call them where you can go take some training. And I believe that sometimes grant money for or even not just grants, but rebate money is tied to having a NABCEP certified installer or designer or something, not always. Um, but I know I've encountered yeah. it before in the past and and learned to ask. Yep, yeah, I think Minnesota Power used to offer a higher rebate if you were, and like I said, the DNR on their projects, they required somebody on site 80% of the time, at least a few years ago, they might again, they might've changed their rules since then, uh, but they do that because Every, you know, people who are looking over this stuff know that NAB, NABCEP takes seriously what they're doing and this, they're upgrading and updating all their tests and their curriculum to make sure they're meeting demand in the newer systems and um, they do a really good job of looking over it. So Jesse, I have a question for you. So you were involved with solar training like pretty early on in the early 2000s, is that right? Is that what I understand? Yeah. yeah so um, we're now in, in almost 20 years removed from that. What have you seen change in those 20 years? And then what do you foresee changing, you know, maybe in the, the five to 10 years ahead of us? So, I mean, just the, it, the money spent into making the installs go faster, just the flashing and the mounts and making sure you don't get water in. Um, that's a, that was a huge, we used to just you know, put L feet on a roof and epoxy it. And, you know, that's, that's all there was. There's nothing else to do. And now there's all these flash mounts that go in. I even saw a mount the other day that you can just attach to the decking and don't even have to hit a truss because it's got so many screws at a pullout load of so much. And I mean, stuff like that is amazing for the speed of installs, the cost of PV. I mean, you can get an American made PV module for 70 cents a watt or less or something like that now. And when you think about, when they put solar on the White House in the 70s, it was 10,000 bucks a lot or some crazy number for it. I mean, crazy expensive. Um, 
battery technology has changed a ton. I mean, just batteries and, you know, not having to have lead acid batteries anymore. Lithium ion batteries has changed. Um, right, so many things have changed. Oh, for electricians, a thousand, a thousand volt line. So we used to just, the most we could install is inside wire people was 600 volts. And now we're going up to a thousand volts to try and get higher DC voltages and lower current so you can transmit on smaller conductors kind of what we do with power lines anyway that seems to be something that's changing um yeah i mean if i would have quit if i would have just stopped learning when i got done with this i'd be i'd be out of business i mean i just everything i would have installed then is gone it's just out of date and you know 200 watt modules now they're 400 watts or more you know they've doubled in size and wattage and uh, it's amazing to see when I saw when I saw solar on my the Barbie house my daughter got for Christmas, I was like, "Well, this this is here to stay." Now I better better start focusing more on this thing. <laughs> it's about as mainstream as it gets. Pretty much. <laughs> and uh, what was the cost per watt on that Barbie install? I oh, ugh. I have to ask Grandpa and Grandma. Grandpa and Grandma, yeah, about it. I don't remember. <laughs> Wow. Well, before we started the official webinar, we were talking a little bit about, you know, the electrician's role in kind of efficiency and PV and some of the work you you talked a little bit about some of the work that you did prior with MREA, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. Um, and I was just really curious, I'd love you to share a little bit of that with the cohort now, because it kind of matches one of the questions that we we were asking a question a little more you know, theoretically, and but you were started telling a story, which was, you know, our question was, it often seemed that PV design and install teams, they just look at sizing, current current loads and consumption, and they are going to give you as big a system as to match that, as opposed to taking a more holistic look at building energy consumption, looking at ways to reduce consumption, at, which would potentially result in a smaller PV system. And um, you've had some experience with that, that it would be great to share. Yeah. So I, I, I think it was in the, during the Obama administration, they had money for a solar shot initiative and MREA got funding and I applied to be, and I had already had my NABSIP at the time. So I applied just to go take classes with them with, which was a train the trainer program. And so when I got there, um, there was a couple other instructors who already had NABSEP with us, and we were just kind of picking up little things here and there. But one of the things they were creating was this uh, solar P residential solar PV site assessor certificate. And that whole certificate was just like, listen, you go into the person's house, check out their electrical service. Is there a, is there a breaker spot for two two pole breaker to go there? Can you tie it in? If it's full, can we tie in at the meter? If it's got fuses. You're gonna have to talk to the customer about upgrading or tying to the meter. Okay, now go out to their roof. Do they have a south-facing view? Get up on their roof, take the solar pathfinder. Is it shaded? Talk to them about the trees that would have to be cut if you wanted to get a good nine to three winter to summer solar window. Is there a spot on the ground? How big is the spot? How far is it from the house? If you trench, what size conductors do you have to put in there? So all that stuff, which is what the electricians will do, right? That's what that's what kind of the work we do. But then you go in and say, oh, you have a fridge in your garage that's got three cans of soda in it. You have a freezer in the basement with nothing in it. And you got an old appliance in the kitchen with this in it. What about uh, upgrading those? And uh, look how much this would cost you to upgrade and look at the energy savings. Okay, then go around, look at their lighting. Do they have incandescent lamps still, fluorescence? Is there motion sensors we can put in rooms that the lights get left on? And then run through that. And at that same time, they're creating a spreadsheet that you could pump all this. I'm not a spreadsheet person. I'm not I'm not good at spreadsheets. So, but they had this great spreadsheet where you could just put in, if you. what if you finance this array? Uh, what if you energy savings first and you could get the return on the investment, uh, which is what a lot of customers want to see. You know, they want to see, am I going to see this money back in my lifetime? And what we found with all of that was every dollar, if this was at the time when we were doing this, every dollar they spent on efficiency, it saved like $3 on the cost of the PV, cost of the PV system. So I mean, it really means the cheapest energy is stuff you don't use. I mean, that's just, if if your goal is to save energy, you have to upgrade apply as much as nobody 
I've never had a customer happy when I tell them their 10 year old fridge is too old. If you want to do this, you need to upgrade it. And you can understand why they, you know, they don't want to upgrade this stuff, but you know, just looking at all these numbers and crunching it, it really showed that efficiency is really important. If you're going to do any type of renewables, you should start. And I've had customers just flat out say, no, they just, nope, just fill the roof. And you know, what are you, what are you going to, what are you going to do? You know, I can walk away from the job, uh, but you, you do the work, but you have the conversation with them because it's got that conversation has to start somewhere. And um, having that with consumers is important. I think that's a lot of this information. I always just saw, you know, when I first started doing it, solar doesn't work in Minnesota. It's too cold. Well, no, cold's good for solar. You have to have these conversations with people first so that the customers know the questions to ask and maybe bypass some of the contractors or uh, electricians or whoever and just go to have them go to the electrician and say, listen, I want to upgrade all this first. I want my lighting upgraded. I want that upgraded. And then we're going to talk about the solar. Uh, that was a long winded answer, but efficiency. I mean, it's, it's kind of everything. If you're going to, if you're going to step into renewables. I wasn't long winded at all. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> my, my kids, my kids would disagree. My, my kids think I'm long winded. <laughs> Well, and I, I wonder too, Jesse, what what are you seeing, um, you know, just in terms of the industry, uh, solar on existing buildings is something that we're pretty used to, but how about solar on a building that isn't built yet? Have, have you been working with those that, you know, in the design phase, but they're already designed with solar in mind? Have you run into that um, in the work you do and the students that that graduate that, that go into the workforce? Yeah, they're, well, I mean, it, my house was built in the 70s and uh, the roof that was put on the south facing roof was built for solar. The, the, my father-in-law built the house and it was, he never, you know, he didn't, he didn't get around to doing it, but it was designed that way. The Pellucci Space Planetarium at Hibbing, south facing roof, 45 degree tilt. It was built for that. So you have older stuff that, you know, in the 70s that was kind of built for it probably. What we're seeing in new homes is just, an, um, running conduit in places. If you think you're gonna put solar on it, run a conduit into the attic. Um, make sure it's metal, make sure it's sleep, make sure it's marked, make sure it's painted red or whatever to identify it as possible solar. Um, so we're seeing that more because it doesn't cost a lot to do that work initially, but climbing into the attic and chasing conduits through a wall space and cutting holes in it, that adds a lot to the job when you're doing it. So there's things like that you can do. Um, and then even, rolling the PV cost into the house is something that I know people are looking at because it, you know, just me, you know, again, I'm not a money person, so I'm not the best person to ask, but looking at it from where I am, if, if you, if I increase the cost of my loan, say take out a 15 year loan for my house and I roll 30 grand into it for solar and it increases the mortgage payment five bucks a month or 10 or 20 bucks a month, I'm going to make way more energy than that just from that system. You usually have warranties if you're getting reputable brand equipment that'll last that length of that time of that loan, probably. Um, so I think there's that avenue too. Just put it in the building and let it pay for itself. And then you increase the value of your home, but not the taxable value of your home. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ways. Again, I'm not a money person though, so I you know, <laughs> look at my. I might not. I might be speaking out of school here, but to me, it just looks like that's kind of a Kind of a no-brainer if you're going to build new, you know. Yeah. Well, and I, I wonder, I, and I don't know what you see see in in your area, but there's sort of a stigma that it's expensive, even though it's quite affordable. Um, I, I, maybe we're still fighting that stigma a little bit, uh, you know, just in terms of. Um, but yeah, only the rich can afford it. Well, I think I think that is part of it. Can I? I'm going to stop for one second. My foot, my uh, computer is going to die. I got to grab my charger. Is that all right? <laughs> yeah, you bet. Stay, one second. Hold on one second. I'm just going to stop the video. Sure, sure. Yeah, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I, you know, it's interesting because I I think I have shared. I put PV on my house uh, Earth Day like three or four years ago and shared all of my like finances around that with my neighbors and it's been kind of an interesting conversation where they still think it's so expensive that they can't do it and we're, we're i mean we're educators so we're the poorest people on the block 
right? And so when we finance, yep. it, it's different than if we pay cash. Like the the payback happened, you know, with our renewable energy credits that Excel buys and 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 the net metering that we have, we were able to cash flow it as soon as we we had it installed. And I think it is one of those things where even though I share that with my neighbors, they're still like, it's too expensive. And like, it's impossible not to do it, at least where we are. Um, and I still yeah. have not convinced anybody. I don't know what it, I mean, I, I don't, to me, when I, I, the last time I haven't looked, I haven't looked at these numbers in a long time, but I thought like the return on the money was this, you know, double digit 10% or something. It's like, well, where are you going to get 10% as just a person in town with your money? It just, there, it's there. I don't, but I don't know what I don't know what it takes for them to see that. I, you know, I mean, listen. I got buddies who have a fifty thousand dollar boat and an eighty thousand dollar truck and a twenty five thousand dollar snow machine that depreciated the minute you drove them all off the lot. But that's just like, yeah, yeah. I got two of them and I rolled one and I get. But try to save energy. I don't know what it takes. I have never figured it out either. I don't know. Energy's tough. I I could yeah. sell countertop and new windows to just about anybody, <laughs> but to do an air sealing and insulating package is so hard. But I, what I see is, uh, look, my grandma, when she was alive, AEOA came and sealed her house. You know, it was like older folks on limited income were the ones who we were doing some of this, which is great. I mean, my grandma needed it done for her and they understood the benefit of it. It's like, you know, older folks on set incomes understand i got to seal the attic and update my lighting and all that stuff but yeah trying to sell it to a person that has the money to possibly do it i don't know what i don't know what the, i don't know what the conversation is i don't know you both work with young people uh daily do you see any shift with who's coming through your classrooms in more openness to the viability and and sort of wanting um, not just renewable energy, but energy efficiency in general and better buildings to be sort of more widespread. Um, do you, do you see that in your classrooms and the people come through your programs? I see it with PV. Like if I had to probably list my classes, favorite to least favorite, if I were to pull my students, least favorite is theory. I mean, it's just this abstract electrons moving wires and they just like, listen, we came to school to work with our hands. I, I didn't came for a physics lesson. Uh, but then you get to like motor control and PLCs and, and solar. I mean, it is, it's their favorite classes. They love it. They ask questions afterwards. They want me to teach in the summer always because I, I used to teach a NABSEP entry level solar class in the summer, just the month of June, we do eight hour days. But COVID kind of wore me out and uh, there was a lot of work to stay in the classroom during COVID to kind of transition to lecturing online and put all my stuff on B2L and record videos and then spread out and redesign everything. So I kind of got beat up a little bit and I needed the summers off. But I mean, they beg me for that solar class. They want to take it. Some of it's just they wanted for their hunting shack or their fish house. And some of it they're super interested in doing it for a career. Um, so there, yeah, it's, it's different than it even was 10 years ago, 10 years ago, the students who were graduating were like solar, yeah, no one does solar, you know, but now you just drive around and banks and bars and hotels and everything and EV all over the range, there is solar all over the place now. So they see it now and it's just part of, you know, what's going on. Yeah, I, I would echo that too. Half of my students are not fresh out of school. So and sometimes it's two thirds are more like career change folks. And, and then those folks are like really values driven in terms of, you know, we need to reduce carbon emissions. We need to do solar. We need to do, you know, all of this. So a lot of my students are kind of coming in with, um, you know, years of having lived uh, in substandard housing and wanting to improve the housing. And then, then also offset, you know, whatever you can in terms of energy costs um, through conservation measures and then, then renewables. But yeah, I see, I see really passionate students when they see the renewable energy pieces and, and, and you know, some of those energy efficiency pieces for sure. My, my older retraining. So we, we had in uh, four or five years ago, we had when the mines were, when the mines idled, we had trade assistance funding. We had students retraining who were laid off. They could go back to school and retrain. So we had a lot of them come take electrical school. 
like that was one of the last times I did the solar class. They do have a whole separate view than mine are 19. Most of my students are 19, 18, 19 year old kids. The ones who I have who've been to work, the training, they worked at a $17 an hour job and they want to go be an electrician now. They have that same thing you're talking about, a whole different set of values and views on energy. Because I mean, a 17 year old, find one that's paid their electric bill. I ask them, how much energy do you use? I don't know. How much is your electric bill? Well, I don't know, like 40 bucks. They know the cost of it, the money, but they don't have no idea what a kilowatt hour is or any of that. But when you start paying your bills, you're like, oh man, alive, I need to turn the lights off, turn the light, you know, you get that conversation with them. So um, if you don't teach that summer class that a lot of students are asking you for, um, is there someone else in the region who can teach that class? If, if I have students who want to go, I send them to the MREA. And I send them to Wisconsin, to, to Custer, to their um, NABSEP requires you have the certificate above what you're teaching. So you have to be certified. You have to have, they keep changing the name of it. I think now it's the PV installation professional. I think mm -hmm. it's the name of it. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to have that certification to teach mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm the only one at the college who has it. So. Right. I know I got to teach it. I know I really should. I, I love teaching it too. So no, I, I wasn't. I, that's, <laughs> that's not where I was. I was, I was going to lead. I was, that question was a leading question to what I suspect <laughs> was going to be a comment about, we don't just need more trades people. We need more instructors. Cause I know Josh, you've run into this too. And we're running into it at a Fond du Lac tribal and community college. They're begging their, uh, PV and electrical instructor not to retire because they haven't found a replacement yet. Well, I, it, I, we, our diesel instructor at the college retired and uh, it's going to be hard pressed to find people to teach the trade programs when the field is paying two to three times what we make teaching. I mean, it's going to be very difficult to find people. You have to find somebody who this fits their lifestyle perfectly because uh, mm -hmm. uh, just the money is just, you know, you can take a, I have a diploma from a trade school. You know what I mean? That's what I have for education. And then I have all my NABSIP and all my on-the-job training and all that, but I can go out and make way more than I can make teaching. And it's, it's difficult to find people for these trade programs for sure. So we all need to be writing our legislators to uh, yeah. raise the salaries of teachers. Oh, I'm serious. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, also, it's, yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely a, uh, the, the legislator the legislature did a uh, pretty good job funding schools last session. I think it was uh, one of the highest uh, fundings for the two year schools that we ever had. Uh, but, you know, years of not that made it, you know, we're kind of where we're at now. So, yeah, I want to be conscious of time. We've only got about 15 more minutes. And I know that Josh and I would totally monopolize you, Jesse, given the chance. Yeah. So, but I know at least one of our uh, of our viewers has a question for you. So please, um, let's. If you've got questions, just sort of raise a hand, unmute, and um, Eugene, did you have a question? Absolutely, I got questions. I got all kinds of questions. <laughs> okay, here we go. Starting number one. So you touched on it just uh, very slightly, and. You know, and I've been talking about this uh, during the class, you know, since I started. And one of the things that's really pa I'm passionate about is um, you can do all these energy saving things, energy star, air sealing, insulation, all, you know, you know, you name it, we can do it. But one thing that's very difficult to change, uh, to, to, to become more energy efficient is changing the behaviors of our people. And how do you approach that in class? Because you, you said it, turn the lights off, you know, turn the heat down, you know, all these different things, you know, turn off the TV, whatever, you name it. You know, there's a million things that we can do to, you know, but that's all behavior related. How do you approach that in class? So at, at home, my youngest thinks that the batteries are going to die if we don't turn the lights off. And she, you know, she doesn't understand that it's, there's no batteries, but so... I have that conversation with my young child. And then in class, we just really, again, in class, they've never seen their electric bill. I mean, these are my students. They've never. So I have to start a whole conversation on 
you're building kilowatt hours. Okay, what are watts? That's volts times amps. Okay, where do we get kilowatt hours? We have to multiply time into it. Um, so I have to start really basically with them there. And then we go around the school and say, look at this old part of the school where we just have switches. Now come to the new end where we have motion sensors in every hallway, in every wing. We'll, we'll stop. We won't let anybody in the hallway for 10 minutes. The lights will shut off and we'll slowly walk in and we'll watch one light at a time turn on. And we'll talk about well, why is that? Well, because why leave all these lights on 24 hours a day in the hallway when the sun is out? You know, so then we put irradiance meters in the hallways that monitor that level of sunlight. When the cloud comes by, maybe the lights get brighter. This is all part of our work as electricians. We install all this monitoring of light, timers for parking lot lights, updating them for daylight savings time and all that. So we start all over with that and then talking about the cost of electricity, how to change the behavior of people. One thing I noticed is when the Prius came out and you could see the, the number of your miles per gallon, it always changed how I drove. I, I, you know, I was like, that's the, my challenge is keep that as high as possible. Somehow showing them daily or all the time that every, those lights that are on cost you money. So we have, you know, sense, I have a, I have a, a system called sense in my house that I have uh, current transformers clamped around my uh, incoming power lines. And that system can kind of tell when a inductive load or a motor's on or a heater's on. And I get updates on my phone constantly saying, hey, you're always on usage increased 25% last week. So then you try to figure out, well, how did my things that are always on increase daily or weekly? So we have the ability with phones maybe to change by giving homeowners data, customers data, real time, like, hey, you left the lights on or hey, the garage heater's left on. I think that's maybe a way to do it too. Um, but I also think it might just take the people who weren't worried about efficiency to kind of go away. And then you have to train this whole new group of young people that just, it's part of their life. And so when they get older, it's just it now. Um, I'm not sure. It's a, it's a tough, you're right. It's a tough deal to get people to change their habits. Well, great. You know, technology absolutely is a, is a key component of, uh, but there's still the, the human element to it that uh, is important. Uh, next yep. question is, um, so where I'm at, I'm in north, I'm in uh, north of the Bemidji area, and we are trying to. We have this term that we're using. It's called energy sovereignty, and we want to we want to um, you know, we 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 want to come less reliant on the energy you know that we get from our local cooperative. And with that, we're, we want to do more solar. So, so we're, we're, we're coming up with different things about solar, but we're having a problem is, you know, you, you talked about it where uh, there's going to be sometimes where there's not enough sun and, 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 and that, but then sometimes there's going to be too much sun and we're not using all the energy. And it, so there's, there's a political component. One is that uh, the cooperative won't buy back the energy at uh, its market value. Okay. Uh, and, and so we're, that's a whole kind of political thing that, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, kind of fight with, but along with that is I'm hearing some pushback from, uh, I, I don't know what directly from the horse's mouth from the electrical companies, but uh, the grid isn't designed to Re to suck all that uh, renewable energy back into the grid and put it back out there. And, and so I heard a little bit about that on NPR. And can you kind of talk on real quick on both those two little items? Yeah, I can try quick, but I don't know if it'll work. <laughs> this is the, the politics of energy are, um, there's, you know, there's some of the first people, you know, to the Capitol to, to talk to legislators. So there is, you know, energy, and I, I mentioned it before, and it is something that um, I, I really do think it's a conversation people have to have. So wherever you're living, if you look outside and there's giant buildings and skyscrapers and steel and metal, and you have a new this being built, that all takes natural resources. That all, that's steel, copper, aluminum, glass, silicon, solar is silicon, copper, aluminum, metal, so this, this, we need to get these materials someplace. So that's the first conversation. So if we're gonna talk about not relying on coal or gas or whatever, 
the, the materials needed to do this have to come from somewhere. And that's a conversation people really need to have because if we're gonna get it from Africa and Canada and those places, that's fine, but that's where it's coming from. So there's that conversation. Then we talk about the grid. When the grid is full, sometimes we say the grid's full, what it really means is most of these utility systems were not meant to see all of this energy either getting put on it or taken off it because maybe the transformers just are not big enough to handle all of the load that's going to get put back onto it. And so they need to upgrade transformers. And then there are just our grid is aging. Um, and I know the infrastructure bill has some money in there for some of this stuff, but we're going to be asking our grid to do a lot more work if we're going to electrify all this stuff, especially with just car chargers. I have a, I put an electric vehicle car charger in my garage and it was like, you know, it was a hundred pounds of copper that went into my garage. And now my, the utility had to come out and look at my uh, transformer to make sure that my solar and this EV and my off peak heat can all go through this transformer now. So there, there it's, it is a real big conversation to have. And some of it, yeah, it's going to take funding to, to do. We're going to have to put money into our grid to upgrade it if we're going to electrify stuff. And it, it yeah. might not be easy to do, but it's something we definitely have to do. Yeah, no doubt. And that's, you know, that conversation is starting, it's ramping up and, and it's going to continue at all levels of uh, of uh, you know, consumer, you know, consumption. Uh, last, yep. last question. So things might've changed a little bit, Josh, maybe you can help me out too on this, but you know, I, I came from a uh, energy auditor background. I kind of, I kind of swayed away from that a little bit and I really love, uh, you know, I had a passion about it and I, that's why I'm taking the class, but there was this there was this confusion about explaining to people that electric electricity is 100% efficient as opposed to uh, like a natural gas or propane or whatever and you know how do you how do you best explain that electric is 100% efficient uh, for energy so in in class we talk about how transformers you know, are like 98% efficient. That's what kind of, you know, you lose a little bit of heat in the transfer of electricity from a higher voltage to a lower voltage or back and forth. Um, so we talk about that. Um, as far as like how the stuff itself works, I don't, don't, I don't do a lot of talking about that in class. We do talk about how we generate electricity though. You know, we talk, we go to the PUC and we watch them burn the tops of trees to make heat, to make steam, to spin a turbine, to generate electricity. And we talk about the Boise plant, how they got the water plant the, on the, the river up in International Falls and how they spin turbines with um, just the running water. So I, I don't I don't really get a lot into how electricity works efficiency wise. I talk about how renewables are efficiency, you know, how a, how a solar system is so efficient at creating, turning sunlight into energy. Um, but I, I don't, I might not be the best one to answer that question. Yeah. You know, and I, I think, you know, just kind of, uh, to add to that a little bit, you know, uh, we have to, you know, the way I explained it was we have to have a baseline. There's a, you know, electrical would be kind of more of our baseline and we can, you can easily compare that baseline consumption as opposed to, uh, 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 uh natural gas kind of consumption BTU. So, but anyway, I just wanted to see how that translated in, into the today's, uh, classroom. So, uh, but thanks for, for that. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a huge piece in, in particular with efficiency of equipment. And then now that we have heat pumps and ground source heat pumps and our coefficient of performances are now positive numbers and you know 2.5 to five or six, even when some of those ground source heat pumps. And then all of a sudden, you know, the the affordability of natural gas is is now you know sort of being ironed out with the efficiencies of that all electric equipment too. So you know, we're we're seeing that gap sort of close. Um, with some of those heat pumps that are, you know, becoming more and more common with those buildings too. But it's it's definitely, I mean, we didn't have to talk about heat pumps 12 years ago when I started our program. <laughs> and that was not, wasn't a big, yeah. a big part of what was going on. And, and boy, the industry is changing fast in the last five years for sure. Yeah, yeah everything is. It's, uh, it's really, it's, uh, it's amazing. Again, I tell my students, like, listen, 
you're gonna need to you're gonna need to retrain. You know, electricians have to take classes anyway to keep your license, but you got to stay on stuff. I mean, we need people just to hang lights and wire schools and run conduit. But if you want to get into something technology, you're gonna spend your whole life learning about the new stuff and taking classes and trying to keep up with it because it changes. Our code book, the electrical code book, the, the the solar section in the electrical code was you know this big, and now it's adapted now it's three different sections and now it's twice as big just because of the technology has changed so much with solar and tying into buildings and selling it back and uh randy has a question for you also i think we do have time for one more or two randy are you there do you want to ask it out loud or do you want me to read it yeah let me see. there how's that <laughs> yes, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you had mentioned that you uh, you're tracking some of your energy use at at, at your home. Um, I do the same thing. I have an emporium um, where I'm monitoring circuits. Yours is smart algorithm, right? Is it, it tracks? Yes. Yeah. Um, yep. Are you familiar with the span panel? Have you seen that one? No, no I don't okay. think I am. Okay. So this one, th there, there's a couple of different uh, versions of the smart breakers that are out. I know uh, Leviton's okay. got Those one. I, yeah, Leviton, I know. We have a Leviton at school that we okay. use in the program, yeah. So the span panel, what it does is you're using a standard breaker. There's like three or four different breakers, just the one inch breaker that you can use in this panel. It's all you know certified for that. But the technology is behind the the system where it's tracking not through the breaker, but through the something behind it. You know, before you plug it into the the the, the bus bar, everything yeah. is behind that. Um, are you obviously you don't know about that one, so you, you, you that one you're not familiar with. Yeah. But are you are you no. training on the Leviton or the I think uh, the the Squared E's have some technology at least coming out if it's not already available. Yeah, I keep getting ads on my phone on youtube for the square d system they must know they're listening to me so they know i'm an electrician uh so i we use the smart I, we have the sense one at school and i have that at home we have n phase which was or uh e-gauge we have a lot of old e-gauge systems that's what the dnr used to install a long time ago so we have e-gauge on our off-grid bimodal home and that's just monitoring the solar though so it looks at irradiance and temperature in the solar and then the Leviton one, we just installed uh, the end of last semester with the graduating class. So this year's first year class will be the first students that will turn that on and, and commission it and look over it. So we haven't in class uh, worked on it yet. So I, I do only know uh, eGauge and the Sense system. Thank you. And I, I would say too, you know, Randy, that's a, a great point in that that monitoring just when somebody monitors their building, they tend to save between five and 15% on their total energy just by knowing. Um, and so it is one of those things where that one-time investment can really, you know, have some significant cost benefit uh, for sure, just in, in creating that awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't I wish know. On the, sense, the sense, well, no, and I mean, I, I agree that five to 15%, that's the number I wish I knew because I, you just feel like when people know you know, money's going out or stuff's going out, they'll make changes if they know about it. Some people, you know, despite your face, you'll do what you want to do. But um, that, that, that number makes sense to me. I wish there was some stuff with the sense one. I've emailed them a bunch of times saying, I wish there was a way for me to like turn the load on three or four times fast and it, it would allow me to name it. I didn't know what that thing was called, the, the algorithm that he, he mentioned. Because I know what's coming on. I know it's like, that's my heater in the garage. I want to name it that. But the system hasn't quite figured out what that load is yet. It knows it's something, but it can take months for it to recognize, oh, that is a heater. And then allow me to name it as such. Mm -hmm. I wish there was a faster way to do that with that system. But The the Emporium, of course, is a, it, once you get that installed in your panel, you got a spaghetti mess. There's so many cables. <laughs> You know, you're monitoring 16 different circuits and all of them have a couple of cables coming off them and it's just a mess to, I've got that in my house, but yeah. Yeah, we train with um, Sense also and then the Energy Detective is the other one that we've been using too. Um, but I think Span looks pretty awesome from what I've seen. 
well, the, if they've got a light and an electrical panel, that's got to be awesome, right? You yeah. open the cover up and a light comes on. You can see everything. <laughs> Why did it take that long to come up with that? <laughs> a couple of uh, Tesla engineers, I think, are the ones that developed that. So uh, that oh. says something. Right. Well, we are at time. I know like that we could go on and on, but I feel like we should respect um, everybody's Friday evening. Jesse, thank you so much uh, for spending some time with us. We're going to reach out to you afterwards and just get, um, just make sure that we've got sort of the names of some of these things that you spoke about today. Okay. And we will send that to all of you who are viewing. It'll go in the, we'll drop a doc in the T3 cohort folder, but we will also, as we have been doing, create a final credit on this webinar, which will be uploaded onto the Green New Deal Housing YouTube channel. And in that final credit, along with a thank you, we will reference, if it's okay with you, where you're teaching, NABSEP programs, MREA, and anything, anything else that you feel is a good reference for folks to learn more, maybe take more training, um, look into things. Training is training's key. You got to keep training. You just got to keep, every time I've done training, it's led to a better job. That's just the fact. So stay in, if you can keep training, keep training. All right. Do you teach continuing ed for builders? I do continuing ed for the mining companies. So I do for their electricians, um, but I haven't done anything. Well, I, well, you know, I taught at the Willow River um, Correctional Facility. I taught an abset class there for two summers. Nice. Uh, it wasn't for builders, but I've, I've done mm -hmm. some outside of the classroom teaching, mostly in solar, yeah. Sure. Excellent. Well, that's probably a good thing to close on. Cool. Yeah, great great yeah. to see everybody. Holy yeah. cow. Thank you all for joining us. We'll be sending you an email next week with updates about the February and March classes. And one tidbit for you all who are still on the call is that we are going to host our final class on March 22nd in person instead of virtually. Um, so we're going to do that in Grand Rapids uh, the day because it falls the day after the Inhabit conference, which we will send a link to everybody about when Sam Friesen gives us a link for the Inhabit conference, which is going to be Thursday, March 21st in Grand Rapids. And Josh and I were already going to be there. So we thought, well, we should just, we should just do the final T3 in person. So look for more about that from us.